is great, Robert. I'm going to be attending one of Jameson's rapture parties. Um, it's, it's something like uh, Beckert's Waiting for Godot is all about. Uh, exactly. Uh, where the bombs are sitting around waiting for something. Uh, for someone who uh, promises to show you it never does. Well, well, it's something like that. Right. Yes, it's funny stuff, all right. What's that? Can you come over? Um, gee, I don't know. Uh, I'm afraid he could sue me for breaking confidentiality. Of course, he's not my—he's not a client of mine, and uh, since he said he was—he said it was a party. That tells me. Uh, hey, you know, I don't think he'd mind. Just make damn sure you keep a straight face, okay? Right, no laughing, no. Yeah. No, you know, he's not dangerous. Why not, you ask? Um, because he's not a U.S. president. If he were a U.S. president, if he were a U.S. president, we would be in trouble. Boy, would we be in trouble. <laughs> Why, uh, a man like that would destroy the world. Um, what's he suffering from, you ask? Um, hmm. I would have to classify him as suffering from a, a syndrome known as religious disillusional disorder. Uh, religious delusion, uh, delusional disorder. Right. Right, exactly. Some Christians like him are suffering from something like it now, called religious disillusional disorder, being that uh, the rapture didn't take place around the year 2000. The trouble with him, though, is that he doesn't realize he's delusional. He still actually manages to believe in God, for one thing. <laughs> yeah, well, um, Robert, I know how much you like being entertained, so you can really keep a so can you really keep a straight face? You'll try. Well, try hard. I wouldn't want to lose my merchandise. What? Um, you know. I've paid close attention to his um, theories. They almost make sense. Which is why I keep tabs on him. I mean, his delusional d theories are better than any theories, any others I've heard yet. Fade to black. Act two, act two, scene seven. Scene. The curtain opens and the light comes on, revealing the living room apartment with a balcony looking out over a red smog-filled Los Angeles in the afternoon, late afternoon. The room is well furnished with a wall shelved with books. A coffee table with chess set is located near the middle of the room. On a wall opposite to that of the bookshelf is a painting of a man being tormented by a mirage in a sea of endless sand. Underneath the painting is a small table containing a lamp with burning incense inside of it. The room also has a television with VCR hooked up to it. The TV is facing away from the audience. Right next to the TV set is a video camera perched on a tripod. 30 feet from the camera is another video camera recording the same scene as the first video camera, but from a different angle. Except for the woman who uh, refused to talk on the phone and the couple who were making out all the characters mentioned in the play so far are now present on the set, either sitting or standing about the room. Dr. Weingreen and his friend Robert are looking at the books in the shelf. Roger and Teresa are sitting on the couch, seeing, on the couch eating popcorn with smiles on their faces. Robert walks up to Roger and asks, um, How long have you known Mr. Jameson? About 30 years. Has he always been like this? I'm afraid so. But he's really... Uh, now, what are the cameras for? You really don't want to know. But um, he set them up for parties like this in the past when he thought uh, Ted Jameson, uh, the one throwing the party, enters the room from the kitchen with, a, with some champagne and glasses. He looks somewhat nervous as he sets the glasses up, but it's a happy and excited sort of nervousness. He wears a patch over one eye and gloves over hands once charred by an auto accident that occurred 10 years earlier. 
Teresa in a monotone. Champagne with popcorn. Yummy. Ted. No, actually, uh, sparkling cider and popcorn. Roger and Teresa with disgust and shock. She's sparkling cider? No, it's, it's champagne. Teresa. Oh. Ted. Something tells me that you are the only ones who are going to be a part of this. Robert. What is, what is it exactly that we are going to be a part of? Ted looks at Dr. Weingreen. You didn't tell him? Did you want me to? Ted. Well, I probably would have been bothered five hours ago, but uh, now I'm glad. I mean, if it's what I think it is, and it sure seems to be this time, then it doesn't matter if you think I'm nuts or not. Because it, it looks like everything is going to radically change anyway. Robert then says, uh, what exactly is it that you think is going to happen? Ted. I think that what is about to take place is the event that many Christians believed would take place around the year, around the turn of this millennium, uh, yet never did. Robert, the second coming? Ted. Not exactly. What I think is about to take place, any time now, is the event known as the rapture. Teresa and Rod, Roger um, kind of snickered. Hey, go ahead. Laugh. Laugh as loud and as hard as you want. You have a right to, because you haven't seen any evidence as to why the rapture should take place. Teresa then says, uh, and you have some proof for us? Then my agreement says, asks, uh, when did you start thinking that this event was going to happen? I'm, I'm glad you asked. He walks over to the VCR and puts a videotape inside it, activating it, causing the TV above the stage causing the TV above the stage and those in the theater uh, auditorium to go on. An Asian woman reporter by the name of Michelle Takashi, about the age of 30 and attractive, is seen speaking English to another reporter on a phone. Below is a sign saying GNN, sent for Global News Network. A picture of the reporter who is talking to her by phone is seen superimposed to the side of Michelle. The sound of machine gun fire is heard throughout the conversation. The voice of the male reporter is heard on the phone saying, uh, voice of the reporter, there hasn't been this much action in this old town since the start of the Gulf War way back in 1991. As it looks from my, as it looks from my vantage point, the Kurds have a reformed bath party trapped in one of the old Saddam bunkers. Ted's eyes light up. The Kurds are starting to bring in happier enforcements. They are actually getting help from what's left of the few remaining Republican Guard units that survived the aerial bombardment from the U.S. Then Michelle says, This is all so sudden. Is it true that the Iraqi dictator Ali Mahdi is trapped in the bunker now under siege? There is a great chance that he is. The orders he has been brought that he has brought that he has been broadcasting seem to be seem to originate from the building now under siege, and if so, then it won't be long until the Kurds are successful with their coup. Michelle and says, "You said earlier that Ali Mahdi had, had Ali Mahdi had some had something had said something disturbing, a greatly disturbing. Yes, that's if one can believe it. And what was it that he said? Um, the same old uh, sound and fury Saddam like dictators before he needs to say. This time, however, Mahdi is reverting to scare tactics. Michelle and Ted at the same time. What kind of scare tactics?" Uh, scare tactics of the desperate kind. He told the world that the Kurds must break off their attack or he will use the nuclear weapons Iraq has been hiding from the world before the collapse of the Soviet Union. He said that the UN inspectors never came even close to finding Iraq's nuclear missiles stash, missile stash brought, uh, bought from the UIN when it was the USSR and that these H-bomb carrying warheads are now attached to missiles that can reach most Middle East countries hostile to Iraq, saying Israel is still the first target. Mahdi said that these missiles will be launched here at sunrise if the Kurds don't break off their attack immediately. He said he's not bluffing, and that if he looks like they, and he said that if it looks like there is no way out of his cor out of this corner he now finds himself in, then he will bring about Judgment Day. 
launching the missiles and incinerating as many infidels as he can. Al Imadi repeated his threat several times, saying that the missiles are very well hidden and that only a massive nuclear attack on Baghdad could possibly stop him. Ted looks at his guests. His guests look at each other and look at Ted. Michelle smiling. Sounds as though he's threatening this, the father of all battles. Or the mother, mother of all lies, being that the... Or the mother of all lies, being that... Um, the UN has been successful in destroying weapons of mass, been so so successful in destroying weapons of mass destruction. Michelle, well, we've got to leave you. Do keep do keep us informed if more if interesting stuff should arise. And let let us hope it is the mother of all lies. She turns to the camera and says, "That was Edgar Roth in, Ed, Edgar Roth in Baghdad." Coming up next, the incredibly high number of pilgrims in Mecca. And in Today in Science, we have, is microtechnology safe? Ted goes over to the TV and turns off the VCR. Says, I recorded that two hours ago. We now have less than five minutes before it's dawn in Baghdad, which is why I just turned on the news. So, what do you think of this? Roger. It is interesting how it seems to fit with what you used to say would happen, but can you honestly believe that the Russians of the 20th century would be so tr incredibly stupid as to sell H-bombs to a country as trigger-happy as Iraq? Then Teresa says, really, Ted? Ted, hey, I admit that it is a bit hard to swallow, but don't you find it interesting how everything I told you would happen is now happening? The Kurds are now on the brink of overthrowing Ali Mahdi. The U.S. gave them air cover from its aircraft carriers so they could accomplish their goal. And the Kurds are from the north of Iraq, just like Jeremiah 50, 46 said would happen. And Robert Jackson, wait, wait a minute here. To Ted, are you saying that just, are you saying that you are you are excited about what's going on over there because you see it fitting the passage in the Bible. And Teresa says he has been for over thirty years now, so he claims. Robert, really? Ted, look, I realize the Bible. I, I realize that Bible prophecy is filled with ambiguous poetry, making it so making it where you can read anything into it. But there are certain passages in it that seem to really be something more than just poetry.